going to begin setting forth this latest in our one anothering study, and we will pick it up next Sunday, Lord willing, in a fuller fashion. It's in one verse that there are two one another's. One verse to one another's. James 5, 16. Stand with me if you would. It's brief, but I want us to stand as we hear this word read today. We read it together earlier. Focus in on verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And my prayer is that the Lord will use this, this, this twin one another's to stir us to some things, grip us with new, fresh commitments as we see the day we live in quickly deteriorating. Thank you. Please be seated. Real quickly, since we've not been in this study for several weeks, remember we began looking at Jesus commands us to love one another. Then we looked at the love of God as the motivation to love one another. Then we talked about loving one another as friends of Jesus. Loving one another as evidence of faith in Jesus Christ. We considered that in two installments. Loving one another with family affection. Two installments. Loving one another as fulfillment of the law. Then serving one another through love. Encouraging and edifying one another. The last time we looked at this series back toward the end of November, we looked at bearing with one another. Today, we'll introduce the idea of confessing sin and praying for one another. The gospel can be distilled into one word and two continual actions. The one word you should know by now is reconciliation. We're given a word of reconciliation, Paul says. We're given a ministry of reconciliation. We've told you that the very cross itself, the vertical relationship we have to God, having been reconciled to God by the death of His Son, and then reconciling to one another the horizontal beam. The very cross is formed to symbolize for us reconciliation. The two actions that are continual are confessing sin and praying for one another. Look at Acts chapter 5, verse 27 to 32. This is when, of course, early days of the new church, Peter and John arrested. They bring them before the council, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, made up of Pharisees and Sadducees and lawyers and rabbis. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. Wouldn't it be a wonderful accusation folks could level at us? Wouldn't it be great to say, You folks at Bethel, you have filled Owasso. You've filled Skyatook. You've filled Claremore. You've filled all the surrounding area with your teaching. Oh, God, grant that. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers, of course, they didn't realize they'd just given Peter an opportunity to preach. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed, by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and Savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. 
And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Jesus was exalted, Peter says, to give, to grant repentance and forgiveness of sins. It's one of the marks that we are enabled to repent. The unsaved person doesn't repent. The unsaved person defends himself or herself, makes excuses, deflects, justifies. The saved person repents because we know we're sinners. Jesus gives that in the new birth. And then forgiveness of sins. Not only the awareness that when we repent of our sin and trust Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior, that we are forgiven, that's the awareness, but also the attitude that we will forgive others. And that's behind this admonition in James 5, confess your sins to one another. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I submit to you that, that in many churches, people do not have the comfort level to confess sin to one another. Now, whether it be a pride, a strange pride, whether it be a, a sense of the, that shame will come upon us, whether it is the, the lack of trust in the person you might confess this to, whatever it is, I submit to you that a climate like that is not a healthy church. It was one of the marks of the early church. It is an admonition by James. Confess your sins to one another. What does it mean? It just means willing, be willing to recognize when you sin. Ideally, we're going to dig into this a little more next week. Ideally, what I, what I hope happens in my life, what I hope happens in your life, is that we've, when we sin against one another, not if, when we sin against one another, that we'll be pricked in our conscience about that. And before that person has to figure out a way to approach us to say, look, I love you, but i got to tell you, you, you sinned against me. Or before someone comes to us and says, look, so-and-so is grieved because you sinned against them. That before that happens, we'll go, oh, Lord, I sinned against him. I, I sinned against her. I need to go and repent to confess it is sin. What are we taught all around us? Well, I made a mistake. Uh, I misspoke. Uh, the world, so fallen, still trying to justify itself just like our first parents did. What is this you've done, Adam? Well, I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't been given a defective wife by you. That's what he said, this woman you gave me. What is this you've done, Eve? Well, if there hadn't been something wrong with your creation, this would never have happened. Brothers and sisters, there's no place for that in our lives. We've been bought by the blood of Christ. We just celebrated the memorial meal, which reminds us he shed his blood for us. He covers all of our sins. And confession of sin is the opportunity to declare just how vast, how deep, how large, how high the death of Jesus Christ is for sinners. Otherwise, people are going to get the wrong impression and think that church is for people who are not sinners. The church is for good people. Confess your sins. So, where do you want to start practicing that? Well, I would suggest you start practicing it at home. Get good at it at home. The last thing you want, husbands, is to start practicing that among the people of God and your wife standing there thinking, well, that'd be nice if that showed up at home. Start practicing at home. And then let it spill over. Surprise a neighbor. Surprise a kinsman who's not a believer. Surprise a fellow worker when you've sinned against them. Go back and say, look, the other day when I said such, such, this, such, such, I sinned against you. Would you please forgive me? I'll never forget Wayne. He stood completely stunned. 
And I'll tell you Wayne's story, Lord willing, next week. He wasn't a believer when I said to him, Wayne, I need to confess my sin to you. Shocked him. So confess your sins and then pray for one another. Pray for one another. Do you do that? How do you do that? I don't mean, dear God, bless everybody at Bethel. I mean, pray for one another. That doesn't cut it any more than, well, bless all the persecuted people around the world. Why, why do you think we plow through every Sunday of the world, putting people before you in foreign countries? And if we live long enough, we'll be, well, America will make that list. Why don't we do that? To pray, to pray for our brothers and sisters in these countries. Do you pray for one another? How do you work off of that? How do you know what to pray? We try to keep you up to date on Wednesday nights. We print a prayer list. I don't pretend it's comprehensive, but I promise you this. If you have a prayer need and you make it known to us, it will find itself in print for our midweek prayer time. Because we believe in the value of praying for one another. Let me give you real quickly. I've got to wrap this up here. A couple of weeks ago, we introduced to you the names of some people, some Oklahoma legislators who are standing in the way, Southern Baptist legislators who are standing in the way of Senate Bill 13, the, the Abolition of Abortion Act, of it getting out of committee, because the general consensus is if it makes it out of committee, it will be adopted by the Senate, the House will adopt it, the governor will sign it. Southern Baptists are standing. And I mentioned some names, and one of the names was Jason Smalley, Senator from Stroud, member of First Baptist Stroud, as I understand. We prayed for him by name here. We prayed for him by name Wednesday night. Thursday, I got the notice from the folks I'm working with who said Jason Smalley has resigned from the legislature. And my response was, hallelujah, one down. We need to pray for Greg Treat. He's more obstinate than ever. Brothers and sisters, how do you know what to pray for one another? Back up. Do you pray for one another? The scripture clearly says, pray for one another. Confess your faults and pray for one another. And then there's a purpose clause given there, that you may be healed. And healing there is not restricted to physical ailments. It's not excluded. But there's many areas of healing that can take place. So here's my challenge. Between now and next Sunday when we get back together, Lord willing, the Lord lets me live to stand and preach. When we will look again at this verse, expanded around Scripture, and ask ourselves, what am I doing to take this one anothering aspect and put it into practice? It's just as vital to living in gospel community as everyone we've looked at thus far. This is simply the latest outworking in twin form of what it means to love one another. How do we do that? Well, because we've been forgiven. Be kind and compassionate to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Will you take this to heart? Will you search your own life this week? Will you demonstrate a gospel boldness, say, you know, I need to go to so-and-so and repent to them? Starting in my home, perhaps, perhaps parents, you need to repent to your children. What a powerful picture for children to see parents repenting. Perhaps we need to repent to our grandchildren, to one another, and then say, God, show me how I can intelligently, meaningfully, with gospel intensity, pray for the one another's in this family of faith where you've placed me. Let's bow together. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We bow before you in Jesus' name. We ask you, Lord, teach us by your word, by your Holy Spirit. Oh, help us to see in our own lives first and the lives of others how powerfully Jesus was exalted as a prince and a savior to give repentance. Help that to be part of the warp and woof in our lives, that it would not be rare in us to keep on repenting, keep on believing, not so that we might keep on being saved, but because you are keeping us saved. You are carrying us to heaven. And oh, Lord, to take seriously praying for one another, praying for one another. We have a Savior in heaven who even now prays for us. May the angels of heaven who look at him doing that not look down on earth and find in this place a people who do not pray for one another. Help us, Lord. Help us to pray for our sin-sick nation that glories in perversion, that celebrates the bloodshed of the innocent, and that tries to hide from this culture the horror that is our Holocaust. Come, Lord, upon this place and these people in power, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. Before we stand and sing, I read a statistic. I'll be repeating it. If we took a moment of silence, we just, we just remembered the liberation of Auschwitz in Germany. If we took a moment of silence for every one of the six million Jews who were executed by Hitler, we would be silent for almost 15 years. Brothers and sisters, if we took a moment of silence for every baby murdered in the womb of its mother, not six million, but 61 million. We would be silent for 150 years. My challenge to you as I challenge myself is rather than being silent, let's speak up vocally, intensely, loudly, unmistakably. If you want to join me in this, I will provide for you the email addresses where we can email these folks and tell them we pray for you and we expect you to do everything you can to end abortion in Oklahoma now. Joshua, lead us in singing before we're dismissed and then lead us in prayer and pray for our meal approaching.
aside and, and worship here without fear of being 